Good morning, it's Dr. Matthew Dunn, the host of The Future of Email Marketing. My guest today, after lots of logistics and errors on my part arranging it, is uh, Marcio Santos of Nerd Digital. Marcio, welcome. Thank you, Matthew. I'm glad to, that we could finally connect and uh, glad to be here. We're talking, we're talking across the country from, uh, from the Northwest to, uh, to Toronto, great city. Um, tell people a bit about Nerd Digital and your, I love the name, and your, your focus and your market there. Yeah, so at Nerd Digital, we coach course creators to get to six figures in six months. Mm -hmm. um, we are passionate about using digital marketing to accelerate their, their growth. Um, and that's, that's what we do. I was very curious to, to talk with you about the course, sort of the, the course world, because am I wrong? It's exploded in the last, I mean, certainly the last year and a half pandemic period, but even before that, it just seemed like everything was just taking mm -hmm. off. And your quote, on, I love your quote on your webpage. We believe teaching is the highest form of, of human intelligence. My, my sisters who are teachers, my mom who's a teacher, would completely agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, yes, for sure. I think your observation is spot on. The, the education market, online education market is huge. It's worth well over a billion dollars and it's, it's only expanding. And yeah. I think a lot of what you've been able to observe are people taking advantage of this, this uh, part, um, great resignation movement yeah. and you know, being, having to work from home and COVID and all these things combined for a perfect storm that yeah. has made online courses a, a really interesting way to make money to leverage your time and leverage your knowledge. Yeah, yeah. Now, let's, uh, let, let, let's jump in the pool deep right off the bat. I remember reading in your bio that you were in a course with a professor and you did a marketing project on the Xbox, if I recall, mm -hmm. and impressed your prof. Yeah. And she said, you know, present in the class about this and then ask you to come back and do that a couple of more times. One, that seemed like a real takeoff point in terms of your own professional focus on marketing. Is that true? Very true. Yeah, I remember, I still remember the day of being in class. And um, when I first heard about marketing, it's funny because a, a colleague of mine at work, she said, have you taken marketing yet? I was like, no, because I was also in, in, in the business administration program like her. And she's like, once you take marketing, you're really going to like it. And I said, I kind of, you know, said, sure, whatever. But once I sat in that chair and I was, man, this is so fun. This is so interesting. And I was really into it. And yeah, I had the chance to, to do the presentation. It, it actually came out of this. I kind of was able to turn a bug into a feature. So I had to miss class because I was uh, going to going on a trip mm -hmm. to the world cyber games, which at the time was run by Samsung and it was essentially like an Olympics of video games mm -hmm. that was going to be held in Italy. So I was going to be away for two weeks from class. And I kind of pitched this idea to my, my teachers, like, hey, why don't I, for my marketing project, which was like the final project, why don't I go to Italy and I research the launch of the product, which is kind of like launching at the same time. Yeah. And then I'll come back and report on it. And so that's what I did. I, I ended up flying there. I, I helped coordinate the event, but then on the side, I kind of gathered data about the Xbox 360 launch, took pictures, like what their branding looked like, what their messaging was like, what the product was like, how they were talking about it. And, mm -hmm. and then I read other books and did other research, but I ended up combining all that into a really cool presentation. That was so much fun to do. So you, so you, well, I mean, one, you ended up with a really, with a really like deep case study on a launch that, that was a big launch with a big amount of, uh, you know, dollars and expertise behind it, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah, for sure. That was a, that was a very important launch. If we're talking video game market, that was, it wasn't the best in terms of overall performance, but I think the gap between PlayStation and Xbox, they were able to close the gap pretty significantly. Um, the PS2 at the time, PS3 yeah. Yeah. was the, the dominant platform and yes. they had, you know, the user base. So against all the odds that they were facing, they yeah. were able to create a, a successful product and bring it to market and and be and be successful let's say so it, it was a fun project nonetheless to do i'm i'm going to come back to your prof but let's keep going down the down the xbox launch rabbit hole because it's fun to talk to an expert uh my recollection is that halo was an extremely pivotal thing for the xbox yes yes yeah, so the halo actually came out in the first Xbox iteration. 
Okay. And then they relaunched it uh, with Halo 2 for, actually Halo 2 came out on the first Xbox and then the Xbox 360 launched with Halo 3. Okay. Yeah. And yeah, so Halo was a it's super important franchise. It, it's a type of game where people will buy the console strictly for that for game. The game. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Nintendo and, and, and PlayStation, they all have these, these, uh, these flagship games, mm-hmm. right? Where people will say, look, I have to have Red Dead Redemption or I have to have the latest Mario. Yeah. I'm simply going to get that platform. They might just buy one game. Yeah. And, and that's it. So yeah, definitely getting the right game in there is, is crucial. The, 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 so calling it software is a little unfair, but the software sells the hardware, and then sometimes the hardware sells the software. Um, mm-hmm. After that, um, fascinating because uh, because I've been around the sector long enough. I'm going to remember the original Xbox. <laughs> my my joke was, "Hey, you finally f- fixed all the stuff I hate about Windows and called it the Xbox." Um, <laughs> <laughs> but watching that watching that back and forth dynamic between that key experience content whatever you want to call it the game the flagship game and the hardware platform which is you know those are an enormous enormous investment and the cost of failure <laughs> like i don't even want to imagine um dot back to your prof and that that uh that inflection point experience though I, it made a difference that she recognized the value of what you've done and and encouraged you right I, I'm, I'm 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 am i wrong in saying oh yeah that really yeah yeah that that was really important for me because at, at, at that point i was just presenting um and at the end of the class everyone was still seated and mm-hmm. they're really engaged and i even clapped after the presentation mm-hmm. and so the professor's like look you've done something good here let's uh if you're interested you know come back for the next uh cohort for the next semester and i came back and then after that she invited me back again and I should have done more with it at the time, you know, in hindsight, I should have leveraged that opportunity a little bit deeper and spoken about it more. But mm-hmm. um, I think from an emotional perspective, it really just made me so proud of, yeah. of, if, of, of like combining something I loved with this, this new area that I was learning. So combining this love for video games, which I loved, combining this love for marketing, which I was sort of falling in love with, and then combining this third piece, which is presentations. Yeah. So, you know, combine all these three things and it was, it was just so much fun, man. And I think that's where I, I kind of love the course creator market because it's really about combining the things that you're good at with the things that are marketable, packaging that up in a way that you can sell it, have a good time, work with great people. So it's, it's, it's fun. It's really fun. My, I love my job. Good to hear. Look at that one from the backside, though, for just a second. Um, And I'm not sure I'm going to articulate this well, but I'll try. It seems to me that one of the differences between the online learning experience and that inflection point experience you had in the class was and is the personal and social element that made such a difference for you. Like the prof saying, this is great you know, get up, present it, you know, you having live relationship with classmates and, and realizing they respected what you did, which you, you implicitly said. And it's hard to find that in online courses for the students. And I suspect that one of the reasons that completion rates tend to be low is is because the social emotional element is, is, is not nearly as uh, integral a part of an online course is it is a live class. What mm-hmm. do you think? I think you've, you've articulated that perfectly well. And the, the types of courses that I've been working on with my, with my clients are what we call cohort based courses. So these are not courses that are, you know, say an evergreen or recorded course where you would record mm-hmm. it, record the videos and you put it on a platform and the person will go through, the student will go through the class on their own, on their own time and learn things on their own. Mm-hmm. The, the types of courses that I'm helping create and promote are courses where we do them live, mm-hmm. where we okay. have live interaction, okay. we yeah, have cool. communi- c- community support and coaching in the program so that people really get to the transformation. So we're looking at completion rates instead of 10, 15% mm-hmm. per recorded, 
we're looking at 70 percent 80 percent oh plus wow that's terrific com yeah. completion rates and yeah. even another key metric is very low churn rate or yeah. refund rate yeah so you know sub five percent wow. even sub sub two percent refund wow. rate wow for the courses that i've been working on um i think speak very highly to that emotional that social emotional support and encouragement that people get from a live course yeah yeah okay well I, boy that's terrific to hear and 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 at the same time i'm not entirely surprised that the numbers are that much difference i'm sure there's are different that i'm sure there's more to it than than just you know the social not social and social light <laughs> element I'm, I'm sure there's more design to it and more thought to it than that but it's still that's a dramatic jump mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. yeah i i think if you a few aspects that the social element bring to it it's it's that one the the instructor themselves if they're live and they're speaking to you and it gives you an opportunity or they actually prompt you to participate that mm -hmm. is going to change how you show up when you when you hit join yeah. you know join the zoom call or join yeah. the whatever call you're using yeah that has an emotional component to it, which is like okay i i'm actually somebody can actually see me and i can yeah. see them yeah and wait yeah. like i it's completely different than you know i was just having lunch you grabbing a, a tuna sandwich hitting play on something and just sitting there passively yeah watching yeah. this you're actively engaged like you have to sit forward you have to straighten yourself up and you know you might look around is, yeah. are things falling apart so it th that i think there's that part the instructor part brings already like this this really strong engagement mm -hmm. the second thing that the instructor brings is coaching regardless or not if they mention that i'm going to coach you in the program they end up coaching you anyways okay and coach and coaching what i mean is the nuanced questions that people have once they've learned the not once they've learned the skills yeah so for example if i'm if you're teaching me email marketing you'll teach me three three key things right you'll teach me about segmenting about building and then about optimizing, let's say. And after you've taught me this, I'm gonna come back and say, Matthew, yeah, sure, I've do done this, but do I segment male and female? Do I segment behavior? Right. And even of these behaviors, do I segment for you know, last, last click or do I segment like this? That nuance is coaching. Hmm. Okay. And, and you. w w when you're in a course, that's so rich. It's so rich. Like if you coach somebody live, Everybody that's in the class will be like, oh, wow, they yeah, have these yeah, light bulb yeah, moments, yeah, these, yeah, these eyes light up yeah, moments. Yeah, you know? yeah. And then the third part, which you mentioned, is the, the group, they bring accountability. Yeah, yeah. And, and almost at, at a fourth is like they bring this transparency and this like just good feeling of, man, if so-and-so can do it, then why can't I? Right, right. If so-and-so is struggling, it's completely fair that I'm struggling too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, or if I hear, you know, if I hear someone who's who's made such great observations in the past ask a question that I was thinking about asking, I say, "Oh, well, I guess that wasn't a dumb question," and I'll listen to the answer, and maybe I'm a little more encouraged next time to to ask my own question and get my own you know micro moment of coaching. Interesting. So you you jumped way ahead of me, man. You went from the the richness of the experience that, that you talked about with your prof to taking some of those same dynamics and, and bringing them into the world of what uh, what you're helping your clients do with their courses. That's fantastic. I just finished um, this is geek stuff, right? I just finished doing a Google Cloud certification course. Um, and it was the it was the the passive online course experience, right? You know, well paced, great mm -hmm. video, good content. It's Coursera, I think. Um, like, can't knock what was there. Getting my butt glued to the chair, and doing the work, was was the hard part. It's like, oh, I should do this instead, or oh, I got to look at that email, and that's distracting me. It's like mm -hmm. the the discipline load on a passive course is mighty high. It's kind of like the thing about when someone says about a workout, right? If you want to really want to succeed in your workout work out with a buddy or have have someone else who's doing it that's holding you know where there's that social bond becomes part of the workout same thing same thing in a course right hey yeah, marcia yeah. i didn't see you in class last week how are things big encouragement right there yep that's yeah. a huge encouragement yeah um is the 
world of, let's call it commercial education, right? Courseware not under the auspices of University of X or Academy of Y. Um, you think we'll see experiments and lessons learned there about education in this hybrid and virtual form that will start to take back into conventional schools? I think so. Um, I think one thing that I've seen at Harvard, for example, in their MBA program is that they created a, an electronic version of their MBA program. Mm -hmm. And they did this in a way where they integrated a lot of this in-class feedback and in-class experiences. Mm -hmm. And I, I think this is, yeah, this is already being done. Like, you know, universities of that level and programs of that level, they've already started experimenting and building um, programs like that. So you could take the in-class, you could go to school, you know, at the Harvard Business School, or you could take the electronic version, but the electronic version is not a lightweight version of the MBA. The electronic version is an experience on its own. It has its own price, has, it still has its value, you can still get your certification and whatnot, your diploma. Um, but the, the experience, it's, it's leveraging technology to still give students a rich in-class experience. So I think that's still, I think that's coming for sure. Uh, mm -hmm. At least market leaders, if they're not, they should be aggressive in, in leveraging technology to, to move forward because COVID hit and they had to close the doors. Mm -hmm. What happens when the next, when the next pandemic hits, whether that's in five or 50 years, you know, what is education going to look like and how are they going to continue to stay relevant? Those are all super important questions that they have to think about and, and, um, that's that's their business. So I imagine that they're thinking deeply about that. Yeah, you you you'd, you'd hope. Um, mm -hmm. As a, I, I was I was a classroom teacher, granted decades ago, <laughs> and I come from a family of as I think I mentioned educators, and and you know I think about that and look look at that a lot because I had formative experiences like you did um, in the classroom with you know with teachers with profs that 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 set directions and and at the same time i i don't think i <laughs> i don't think i would sign up for a live classroom experience right now it's like wait a minute you know like like the harvard mba you mentioned actually my, my friend lisa jones is in that program i think um it's like and i think she's doing the virtual one i'd consider that why for the same reason people aren't wanting to drive to the office right now right like mm -hmm. we've gotten our taste of of work from home is not the right label of of a digital plus life experience that's more in our own control mm -hmm. and i suspect that educational institutions that are rooted in live classroom are going to face some serious pressure mm -hmm. i mean your yeah. customers your clients in a funny way are 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 an alternative are not a threat but certainly an alternative mm -hmm. um, to I've got to go spend four years or six years doing X, Y, and Z in this place with Ivy on the walls. Yeah, for sure. I think in any unregulated field, mm -hmm. as long as it's not like medicine or, or something highly regulated like that, mm -hmm. the requirement to go to a university is it, it, it's, it's just not there anymore, right? You don't need to go, you don't need to go to college to learn how to make money. On, you know, no, you don't need to go to college to figure out how you can create your own career and, and 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 create your own path and that's what a lot of course creators have, have been able to do hmm. yeah yeah at the same time having written a whole bunch of tuition checks in the last eight years um i'm still uh, i'm still a fan of the formative experience particularly for the you know 18 19 20 20 something year old like I said to my, we said to our son, so like, you're going there to learn how to learn, not, mm -hmm. not to learn X. And that's what you're going to do the rest of your life. Cause you're not, you're not going to do mm -hmm. one thing the rest of your life. It's just not how the world works anymore, which is a wonderful yep. thing, but you better have, you, you, you better have the hardware and the attitude that you're a lifelong learner. You can constantly acquire new skills because that's your biggest asset, I think. In, in a world of fast change. 
Yeah, precisely. There's a few things I would highlight up there. One is change as being the only constant in our world. And it's, it's, so that's one thing. The, the second thing that you point out is the hardware. You said this, the hardware that you're going to need, right? The hardware and software. And again, that's so, so true. It's really the emotional intelligence mm, yeah. part of the equation is yeah. so much more important than the IQ part yeah. of the equation. Yeah. And I think that's that's a big part of why you go to you have experiences so that you can learn to deal with others and with yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And Good. again, the CBC, the cohort base course model helps with that. Yeah. Because if you're trying to do everything on your own, like you said, the self-discipline part becomes too onerous on you. It's so heavy. You kind of outsource this a little bit when you're doing it with the group. Right. So the, the discipline kind of gets thrown outside so that you're being pulled instead of having to push yourself. You're being pulled right. by right. a friend saying, hey, Marcia, where were you? Or by a professor or instructor saying, hey, did you get this? Or by seeing other people's progress and being, man, I, I would really love to participate in that. That's mm -hmm. completely different than saying, oh, I should do this. Oh, it's on yeah. my list yeah. Yeah, versus, man, I would love to jump in there. Yeah, I see what you're so saying. It, it flips that equation. Going back to the first point of... Um, content rate of change that that is something very serious and again that i think that's why the cohort the the course market is going to continue to increase mm -hmm. is that things are changing and things will the the workplace let's say is changing in greater complexity and the complexity of change is going to happen at a much faster rate yeah, yeah. and so if yeah. we come if we combine that with living longer and having to work longer yeah then that means that into our 60s and maybe 70s and 80s, we're going to have to adopt a new career that's even more complex than the one we had before. <laughs> so how do we how do we deal with that? Not not strictly yeah. on a technical level, no. But then emotionally, yeah, emotionally. How do you yeah. how do you do that? And psychologically, how do you yeah. say like, man, I used to be this type of person. Now I'm this type of person. Like who who am I? And my friends were there. Yeah. And now my friends, I need new colleagues and like it's it's hard to make those transitions yeah it, well yeah especially especially if somehow you framed it and thought that you wouldn't have to or shouldn't have to it's got to be even harder as opposed yeah. to i get to how cool is this um i'm going to backtrack i'm going to backtrack the first half of what you're talking about because it's really a totally astute observation about outsourcing that um you know, outsourcing a little bit of the willpower. I might even, I might even say we could reframe that and and say that we end up creating a we end up creating a stronger structure by leaning on each other. Mm -hmm. Right. It's not just you know my ability to sit down or not sit down and do the coursework. Yours as it, yours to do the same independently, but by leaning on each other, we're actually both able to accomplish more multiplied by size of group up to Dunbar's number or something like that. Wow. Yeah. I uh, yeah, you're 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 absolutely right. Those are very astute observations about both the market and the imperative for continuing to reinvent learning cuz you're not gonna, you're not going to have one career. You're just not. Mm -hmm. Even in your 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s as you said. I'm I'm a huge fan of uh uh Warren Buffett's Warren Buffett and his partner Charlie Munger. I mean, they're both in their 90s. And they both go to work every day and yeah. they mostly spend the day reading and thinking like, that's a cool gig. I like that idea. That sounds like fun. Right. <laughs> right. And they've mastered, they've mastered these key fundamentals of being able to read, but not, I mean, read is the mechanism. Yeah. What they're actually doing is gleaning insight mm -hmm. and figuring out out of all the noise, what should I pay attention to? Yeah. 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 That 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 is probably one of the, like from a technical perspective, the most important skills that you can learn today, regardless of whatever field you're in. Take email marketing for example. Yeah. There are millions, millions, virtually millions of things you can do as an email marketing manager or specialist or expert. Yeah, millions. Yeah. Which one should you do now? Yeah. Yeah, and, and being and, able to decide that makes a difference between being a great a great email marketer having success and being an average and and the distance there is is humongous like knowing a key few things that you could tweak and optimize can completely change your email marketing program which will completely change your business mm -hmm. it's true 
That's true. And and those those uh, those models and structures, as as you said, what uh, you know, what Buffett and Munger are, are, are good at at gleaning from all the reading. They're not um, writing them down on a page or two is not the same thing as understanding them and adopting them, mm-hmm. right? Um, and 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 they change, right? It's not like they're completely timeless and 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 nothing has to has to shift but yeah it's an interesting puzzle i talk with uh, some of the some of the most uh, some of the most uh sort of accomplished email marketers um out there are, are you know people that i've gotten to know over the last few years and it, it's interesting how much they have they talk about the same things like they all get that the fundamentals and and the keys are a relatively small set of things but like they also get paid a lot to to know that those are the key things and to apply those and walk into a complex situation, big company and say, wait a minute, you need to do this and that and that first so that we can then grow this. And, and like in theory, someone there should have known that, but they they didn't apply that. And, and these folks who really are top of their field know that you have to. It's, you know, it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's like a coach ragging about your fundamentals if you're on the basketball team or something like that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it's hard to, it's hard to overlook. It's hard to, it's easy to overlook. Right. Um, but if you even use an adjacent type of case study with Tom Brady mm-hmm. and you, yeah. you look at every off season, the things that he does, he's not looking at, at least from what I've observed, it seems like all he's doing is going back to more fundamentals. Yeah. Like, is can his footwork get better? Yes. Like how fundamental is that? Yeah. Can his speed of from the you know pulling his arm back to moving it forward can yeah. that go faster? Yeah. He's not talking about launching a long ball like sixty yards. Can I throw sixty three yards? Can I? It's not about that. Those are. It's it's really about the smaller tweaks and fundamental things that he can do to really just crush everybody out there. Yeah, yeah. Um, I you know older example, but Larry Bird, basketball player. Like, what what did Larry Bird do in the off season? He shot baskets. Yeah. All day, every day, he shot baskets, and and you yeah. you, you watch old footage of him, and it was it was a, he was a genius on the court. Yeah, you know, I heard I heard this funny story. I don't know if you know the same story about Larry Bird, but I heard that he had to record a commercial back in the day with Michael Jordan. I think this was like a McDonald's commercial. I haven't heard this. And in the commercial, they had to miss shots. So they put them on the court. They got the lights ready, cameras. Yeah. It's like, okay, Larry, we need you to shoot, but we need you to miss. And it took him forever to, to miss. actually miss. <laughs> because like, like what you're saying, he was just so, so, so such drilled. an expert. He's like, okay, let, let me try. And But we need to... We, you need to hit the rim. Yeah. Oh wow. Because yeah. they needed to have, you needed to like bounce so that you know the camera could see it. It, it couldn't like just throw the ball anywhere and get, like yeah. airball it. Yeah. We need to like hit the rim. Can you? He's like, I, I, it just goes swish every time. <laughs> That's a great story. And I mean, it it, it kind of makes sense. What's the what's the quip? Everyone wants to be a everyone wants to be a rock star. No one wants to play scales. You know, mm-hmm. guys like that play the scales all the time. And 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 end up with the payoff. I don't know if I buy. Um, is it Malcolm Gladwell the ten thousand hours in a field? I, I I don't know if I buy the exact number. I mean, there's ability, there's discipline, there's there's practice. But you find someone who's really good at what they do, and s- there's work somewhere on what we're talking about. Fun, you know, the f- uh, fundamentals, principles, and 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 often learning those learning those the hard way and till you realize what counts and what doesn't count. And I think that's, that's the value of a coach mm. is a coach mm. will help you identify where you should place your attention right now mm-hmm. and how you could break down your work into something that's, let's say like a, an experiment so that you could practice on the key thing. Mm-hmm. So from a coaching pers- from a course perspective, for example, when I start with my clients, I always look at what, where, where are your strengths? Sometimes we, we always look at um, your, your weaknesses or, you know, what you're lacking. Mm-hmm. But I always like to look at, okay, where are you strong? Mm-hmm. Do you have a strong LinkedIn following or Twitter following, for example? Or are you really good on video? Um, do you have connections at, at other companies? 
that have, can help us with PR to promote your course? Mm -hmm. um, is your is your knowledge? Do you have a lot of years of experience in your field? What is it about you that makes you super strong? And how can we leverage that for your campaign? Oh, interesting, interesting. Yeah. yeah. So that's 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 in some sense identifying your, your your work of identifying their fundamentals and which ones are already dialed in, so to speak, and and then which ones will need to be bolstered, developed, worked on. Exactly. And, yeah, and again, what are, just, what are just the three things that we could work on and say like the next 90 days mm -hmm. to, to really get you there faster? Because I have like our program has nine steps, but I don't buy the, the idea that, okay, go through step one, step two, go through all the steps, regardless of where you are. I think everyone comes at it in at a different position. Mm -hmm. And I try to get them through the program as quickly as possible because by doing that, they're going to make their revenue and they're, you know, they'll be able to help people. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's like that. I, I look for these, the, the best opportunities for growth and we focus, we focus there. Got it. Got it. So you're, you're, you're not just, here's the rubric, everyone follow it, regardless of where you're, uh, where you're coming from and what you're bringing to it. Uh, it's, it's fit it intelligently to the person, are there are there in your observation any um, any common characteristics, attributes, experiences that you see in people who find themselves saying, "I can teach this. I've got a course in me. I've got a you know a, a coaching track in me." Hmm. I haven't I haven't observed that specifically, but I think one thing that I have observed on the flip side is imposter syndrome. Hmm. And people feeling like, oh man, I don't know if I can teach that. Yeah. I, I don't feel like I am an expert in that. <laughs> I don't feel like I have enough credibility in that. Right, right. And Interesting. I was having a, this is a coaching call just this morning with a super bright girl. And she's so talented, so skilled. She has so much going for her. But and, and part of the, the job is like, you got this. Like, trust yeah. me. Yeah. You're going to, you're going to nail this. And where, whatever lies outside of your sphere, your sphere of comfort, we can learn that. Right. Okay. You're asking your audience to learn. You should be able to learn as well. <laughs> right. And, yeah. and learning is there's, there's fast ways for us to learn. If you, you could actually buy somebody else's course mm -hmm. and learn just like one small piece mm -hmm. that could enhance your course. Gotcha. Because, if somebody has it in their course, for example, they probably have case studies, they probably have examples and templates and, and frameworks mm -hmm. that you could learn and adapt for your own course. You could do that in a book. You could do that by hiring a consultant. You can go on Clarity FM and call somebody. You could go on a podcast and learn, listen to Matthew Dunn's uh, Future of Email Marketing, learn from all the experts that he's interviewed to accelerate your learning. Right, right, right. right. There's tons of ways that you can hack your learning so that you can get there faster. Mm -hmm. Nobody is an expert at, any, at everything. That's a, right there's this there, there's this pencil problem that nobody knows how to actually make a pencil <laughs> some people some because it's so complex some people might know how to extract the graphite some people might know how to cut down wood some people might know how to paint and write to do all the but nobody actually can do all of the pieces together and give you a pencil and that's a simple that's a simple product so why should we expect that you should be able to do everything else like build a company, an online course and all this stuff and market it and design it, launch it. It's things are complex, man. So give yourself a bit of a break and maybe some humble pie and, and, and realize that you need, you need support in some areas. Right. I, I, I can't believe what you picked as an example because <laughs> I, I'm, I don't, I'm sure there are other people who have read it, but I read a fascinating book on the pencil, uh, Henry Petrosky. Wrote a book on the pencil. Uh, seriously, the pencil. Cool. And one story, two stories out of that book. One, um, uh, Thoreau, Walden Pond. You know the famous, "I'll I'll go live in the woods and and discover you know myself, and I will be I will live very simply, etc. Cetera, etc." Cetera. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So here's the joke. When it's not the joke, it's the truth. Uh, when Thoreau sat down and listed the stuff that he was going to take to go live in the woods in the cabin, the one thing he didn't have on the list was the pencil he wrote the list with. Hmm. And the punchline is, guess what his family did for a living? They manufactured pencils. I'm not kidding. Really? <laughs> yes. 
Yes. Interesting. Yes. And and to me, I, I, I that one just stuck in my head because it's it's such a vivid example of that the axiom that successful technology has become invisible. The pencil was a revolutionary technology because it used to be your fingers got dirty when you were writing. Mm-hmm. And a pencil's like, this is amazing. I can make marks. I can write all day long. I don't have to dip something in a well. I don't have to go cut feathers off a goose. This is amazing, right? Mm-hmm. And so his family, if you think about it, the business they were in was was like high tech of their day. Oh my gosh, you make a writing device that that doesn't get ink on my fingers and, and that that works forever and, you know, mm-hmm. it's upside down and stuff like that. And yet to him, it was an invisible technology when he meticulously, with a pencil, wrote the list of stuff that he was going to take to the woods. Mm-hmm. Oh, Fascinating. That's a, really, that's a really good story. I'm going to remember that one. Yeah, it's a, it's actually Ken, Henry Petrovsky. I can't believe I remember. I've got it it's on, on the shelf upstairs. Yeah, it's actually, it's a, it's a darn interesting book. And there were a lot of, there were a lot of technological steps in the development, you know, of, of, of that humble looking, you know, puppy, like the, the graphite and mining, which was, there are fairly limited number of places that we could pull that stuff out of the ground before we started doing it synthetically. And then the manufacturing processes, like you probably got hexagonal pencils. This one happens to be around, but the manufacturing process is to make the wood, get the graphite straight, put all that stuff together. Like that was high tech. Mm-hmm. In its day, there was there were national you know national contention about who had the profitable graphite mines because there was a finite supply of that stuff. It's like, mm-hmm. dang, pencils of technology. Yes, it is, and yep. you know, stuff we think of as high tech now. You know, if if, if someone pulled a Walden two point oh, if some kid said, oh, "I'm going to go live by a pond and I'm going to be life very simple," I doubt they'd probably put their phone on the list, but I bet they'd take it with them. For sure. Right. It's, yeah. it's a successfully invisible becoming a successfully invisible technology. What do you mean a cabin with no net connection? Inconceivable. Right. Mm-hmm. Try, put, try putting that cabin on Airbnb and see if anyone books it. <laughs> Not yeah. going to happen. Yeah, for sure. If you can't take Instagram photo, did it really happen? Yeah. Right. Right. But back back to the your root point that got me off on the pencil story. Um, you're right. The notion that we should be able, should we in any of us should be able to do all of the pieces required to run a modern enterprise. Now, even if it's a one person scale enterprise, like that's a daunting list of competencies, mm-hmm. really hard. And you can outsource, you can outsource them or, or pay someone to do them or pay to learn to do them if you want, if you're going to do them often enough so uh, stop thinking you have to be code complete just to get started i think it's kind of your message there yeah yeah for sure it's um launching a course doesn't have to be complicated there's essentially three parts that you need to master but uh usually when you're first getting started you might simply be an expert on what you teach but Mm -hmm. not know how to market that and that's a huge huge barrier that you need to master in order to to be have success for sure yeah for sure for sure. And that is that is that one of the biggest um, sort of is that one of the biggest levers to, to turn what's what someone's got in, in the way of expert knowledge in a domain into a viable business and product? Definitely. Marketing definitely. Side? Yeah. So the, the three main parts are you have to master your product. Yeah. You have to have a funnel and then you have to have traffic. OK. And so usually people will think that no, oh, I just have to get people to buy my course. It's like, yes, but before that, you have to have a course that is trying to solve a marketable problem to an audience that is also marketable, meaning that the group itself has to be in a, in a market that's not shrinking. So if you're trying to sell advertisement, you know, a course that teaches you how to buy advertisement in newspapers, that's not a good business. Right. If... Um, and then for the transformation, what we call the course transformation, we, we need to make sure that people are willing to pay for this problem. Like, is this a 3 a.m. problem? Is this a, I have a, a bleeding neck and I need a solution now? <laughs> or is this the type of, you know, it would be nice to have this solution. Mm. You'd need to have a starving crowd for, for, your, course, for your course transformation. Uh, if it's a nice to have, people aren't going to buy or your conversion rates are going to be super low, which means that you're going to have to spend a lot of time and effort to acquire people's attention to turn them into leads 
and then to, mm -hmm. to sell them into to your course, which is all those three things are difficult to do. So, but if you're able to, you know, to master your, your, your product in the, the avatar, the transformation and the message, that's like the first step of the three to make sure that your course could be successful. Sounds like, sounds like you're a fan of a uh, hundred million dollar offers. Very. Yes, definitely. Yes. I've I read just it read, to... I just read it a couple of weeks ago. I was like, holy cow, this is good stuff. Yeah, wow. I've read it back back to front. I have the auto the audio version, the digital version. I've <laughs> looked at it online. Yeah, it's yeah. it's really good. It's really yeah. good stuff. It's really it's really good stuff. Yeah, and I've read I've read a lot of different you know business and 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 you know I've I've read a lot of stuff in that domain. Uh, that's the top of the stack for me. I have to say, like it's really such good. such clarity and and simplicity in a way. Talk about your fundamentals, right? Like you, yeah. what you just said, you essentially quoting, I forget the, I forget the author's name, but you were essentially quoting him about, you know, the starving crowd. Yeah. Like, Alex Hermosi. Yeah. His, his okay. example was Alex Hermosi talks about the yeah business case or uh, business teacher who goes into class and asks people, you know, if you're starting a business, what's the most important problem? And right. kids, you know, say things like, Oh, you need to have an idea. You need to have a market. You need to have a product. You need to have whatever it is. And he says, you know, you need an have a starving crowd if yeah. you're selling hot dogs outside of a stadium at 3 a.m yeah. uh yeah. i'm sure you're going to sell out yeah yeah exactly yeah Audi hungry audience and if your expertise is you know if your expertise that you want to that you really feel a need to, to to share in a course is for is is for what looks like a not starving crowd then maybe you need to figure out whether that's the right course or where the starving crowd for that knowledge is mm -hmm. exactly yeah. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. Um, sounds like you're pretty passionate about your space. Definitely, man. Every time I get to, you know, to sit with a new course creator and brainstorm how we're gonna get them to six figures very quickly. Yeah. Like I, I just, I just love it. I, I absolutely love it. Every call I have and every time I see them progress and when we do a launch and we we hit our goal, it's yeah. I love it. I love going through for now at least. Uh, going through this experience with each of my my clients is so it's so much fun. I read a quip the other day, or it may have been may have been a headline on a news feed, and the guy said that he said everyone's got a thousand bucks worth of content on their Google Drive. They just don't know it. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, right. And you're like, well, yeah, you know, whether it's that great Excel model or something that you wrote or whatever, like everybody's got everybody's got something they tend to be darn good at and they don't think is actually that big a deal imposter syndrome and that you cited a minute ago um and they and we all undervalue what what we know i suspect mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> yeah definitely it, it, it's hard it, it almost goes back to that story about the pencil it's like once you've learned it you're you're now cursed with knowledge and you, knowledge. you can't yeah. see it anymore yeah you can't see it anymore so you, you, you don't know, you overlook all the steps, the 10, 20, 30 steps that you take to get X result. You kind of overlook them. It's like, oh, I, should, I just do this. It's like, no, actually you do 50 different things, man, to get to, the, to that end. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Or, and, and once you, once you, once you've internalized them, you forgot how hard they were when you were, you know, when you were learning that. I mean, as I've learned new fields, it's like, stuff that was just a monumental struggle that took days and now it's like, I know to do bet 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 on the way there how do how do you know that well probably because i banged my head on the wall not knowing it first you know the first 60 times i did it or something like that yeah and 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 i'm i'm pleased to hear the active work to bring the the cohort model and the social dimension and that lean on each other um structure to the vital job of helping people continue to learn and develop to develop skills to keep up with a fast-changing world mm -hmm. yeah yeah it's, it's it's fun man important it's work you're doing where does email marketing fit into this world of yours because we were supposed to talk about that at some point along the way <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I was just thinking about that. And email marketing plays a crucial role. So after after you get the, the product right, like mm -hmm. we mentioned, mm -hmm. the second part is to build a funnel. And after the funnel essentially is, you know, you need a landing page. Your landing page, you need a lead magnet to give people. And then you need to have some kind of way to build trust with this audience. 
in this in the phase three, we talk about the launch, right? Building traffic and launching your your course, and the launch sequence is super crucial. To email plays a crucial role in that sequence. So there's essentially two key flows that you need to develop for in, in terms of email marketing. One is a nurturing sequence, mm -hmm. where you know people become new leads. How do we nurture them to the next step? Whether that's going on a webinar, a free workshop, or a phone call, or something to get them a little bit deeper after they've you know gotten your lead magnet. Mm -hmm. So having a, that nurture sequence in email is is very important. The next flow that you want to have is a, is a launch sequence. So the launch sequence is out of all of these people that have become leads, which ones have displayed behaviors that tell me that they're interested in the launch? Have they signed up for specifically the launch you know, uh, lead form? Have they downloaded the course syllabus? Have they come to one of the launch uh, workshops? So all of those three things, those behaviors could be indicators for a launch. And if people continue to read emails in the launch sequence, well, then you know that they're interested. Um, and then you could even go deeper into that and score them, segment them further, uh, and then have specific actions that you, you take to, to get to convert them into your course. So email is super important. It's the, it's the permitted back and forth um, information and knowledge and relationship exchange mechanism of choice, right? And you're not paying, it is. It, and you're not paying someone else, and letting them control whether or not people see it. Fairly critical. Correct. I mean, it, it's one of, if not the most important, owned channel that you can have inside your business. Yeah. yeah. And the, like you said, this back and forth, this digitization of the conversation, is email is the best way to do that because really, what the email is doing is essentially digitizing yourself or you as a salesperson or marketer. And having the conversation with the person to nurture them through the funnel mm -hmm. from, oh, I downloaded a lead magnet because I was interested in this topic, but now I'm going to have this conversation with you about, did you know that this is just one part of the puzzle if you wanted to get the transformation? Are you, do you realize how close you are? Do you see that you're wasting time or that you're struggling with this? Do you realize that you don't have a clear path? Yeah. And have this conversation until the person says, you know what, I think Matthew's onto something here. I think maybe I should take this next step and join the workshop to get more answers, more clarity, more, more support. Right. I taught a, I'm going to really date myself here. I taught a course internal inside the company on using email for business communication before anyone had an email address. So this is corporate email. And I called it frozen speech because I looked at email messages in my inbox. It's like, this is not prose. This is not writing a letter. This is much more like a long, slow conversation in terms of how we work with each other. And that was email for work purposes, not necessarily marketing. But I suspect much the same um, sensibility, tone, cadence applies to marketing emails as well. It's like, talk, talk to me, not at me. Talk with me. Don't, don't bombard me. It's funny, I, you're, that ping you just heard on the mic there was a, I got an email marketing outreach from a from a, a company about their partner program, and she did the follow up thing, you know, like two or three times, hey, and carefully written conversation uh, to try to get me to respond. I finally did because I was interested. I said, well, I have been meaning to reach out. Let's schedule a time, and I could tell she kicked over to actually writing it herself at that point. And you could just see the difference in a relatively small number of words with how mm -hmm. she handled the prose, how informed she was, et cetera, et cetera. So like, yeah, it is the vehicle of choice. And, and uh, man, that's, that's a big asset when someone says, yes, I'm willing to hear from you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's huge. Attention is the, the most important thing that you can have as a business today. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it, it's important at every every phase, right? So if you're trying to attract new customers, attract new talent into your business, and even keep the people that are working in your business interested, yeah, you ha you have to keep their attention. Yeah, and email is is a great way to do that. Yeah, and even if there's there's a there's a wonderful uh, wonderful uh, expert in the email marketing space, a fellow named Della Quist, a, f a friend. I've had many long conversations on the phone with him. And he's, he's made the observation more than once that even the email that doesn't get read counts. Like the fact that 
I saw three or four messages from, from the young lady that I mentioned about company X in my inbox. Did, did I read them? Not necessarily. But by the fourth one, I'm like, okay, yeah, I've seen her name before. I recognize the company. Maybe I should open this one. So her first three may have looked like they were wasted. They were not. Mm -hmm. And and that that's probably part of the discipline of that funnel design you talked about is keeping the cadence going, even if it looks like no one's home, because they said, yes, I'll, uh, that, yes, I've opted in. I want to hear from you. So stick with it. It'll pay off sooner or later. Isn't it an average of six or seven touches before someone actually engages or buys or whatever? Yeah. I don't remember exactly the exact number. I've heard between anywhere from six to 16, uh, <laughs> different, different touch points that you need to make with somebody before they're ready to buy. Yeah. But uh, de definitely the, the email is super important. And as you said, not every email is going to be opened, right. um, but that doesn't mean somebody didn't read it, right? So right. if you're using Gmail, for example, you can always see a preview of the email. You see the subject line, you see like the first sentence yeah. of that in your inbox. Yeah. yeah. And that counts as, let's say, an impression yeah. inside someone's uh, email inbox, which is a super personal space. Super personal space. Yeah. 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 Do you, do you, uh, when you're scanning through, one of your inboxes, because I'm sure you've got more than one, like all of us. Mm -hmm. uh, do you look at who it's from first and subject line second? Because I do. I think so. I think that's that's how it's ordered. It's it's the the first. It tells me first the person column. first. Yeah. yeah, and or sometimes it's interesting. It's date call date from subject line, depending on your email yeah. client. I'd have to cheat and look because I don't remember right now. But, <laughs> Me too. <laughs> but, 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 but I'm thinking about, I, I just saw Hank's name the other day. He's, he's a client. Uh, he was a client of ours from Capital Allocators. <clears throat> and I remember this was an old email, email that was unread. But as soon as I saw his name, like I stopped and I looked at the date. I was like, oh, wait, no, I, that's an old email. I've already dealt with that issue. But it's so interesting how, how names of people they they can really jump out at you once you recognize them and you yes. have a connection with them their names really yes. seem to jump out at yes you. yeah yeah and i suspect you know this goes back to the first part of our conversation about uh, the social element the cohort a name in my inbox of someone that i've actually got a face-to-face -face relationship with i suspect it at a pure physiology level my brain is going right is doing different stuff when i see it when i get an email from you in the future it's going to register differently because we had this conversation, right? It's like, mm -hmm. I know who that is. My brain already knows who that is. It's not like I have to go look it up in the stupid CRM. Like, oh, Marcio, yeah. Oh, yeah, that was a great conversation about that. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. you know, motion attached to it, knowledge, history, all that stuff attached to it. And, and it takes some time and persistence to earn that, especially if you're only an email message for the, for the initial part of the relationship. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Hmm. And we thought this was simple, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, there are many layers to it, yes. right? And as you, as you get into creating your course and marketing your course, you start to realize that, man, there, there are a lot of nuanced things that you have to get right, yeah. that you have to put in place so that you can um, really be scalable, right? You could, you could hand write a bunch of emails, but yeah. you're, it's going to turn into your new nine to five. And I think a lot of us, when we're creating a course, yeah, the the draw is, you know, how can I replace my nine to five, or how can I, you know, quit completely and just do the things I love and sell the course as a, as my means to, to you know, to earn my keep. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Which is which is, I imagine one of the fundamentals you have to help your customers understand is the investment of time in getting this email sequence written pay will pay off and you know pay off like crazy eventually but you really need to do this you cannot keep up and succeed if you write them all by hand sorry because yeah, exactly it's only 24 hours in a day and if you if things take off you couldn't possibly write them all so you yeah so you know yeah so after going through a few launches and going through a few helping different clients with, with courses recently. So I, I work with uh, Kehi from, from radreads.co, uh, capitalallocators.com um, with Ted Seides and his team up there with the Robbie Crabtree um, and a few other clients as well. And um, 
what we've been able to develop thus far is a series of, of templates that will get you 80% of the way there in terms of emails. Nice. Wow. And nice. the final 20% is crucial though. Yeah. The final 20% really is all about customizing these emails so that it fits the voice of the course creator mm-hmm. um, and talks about the key solutions that this course solves for that avatar. Mm-hmm. And even after I give you the templates, it's still going to be a ton of work yeah. to go through each email and really read them and really refine them to make sure that everything gels, it gels well. So it, it's something definitely helpful because it provides a framework for you to work within. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it, it allows you to be creative within that, 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 you know, that frame. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Larry Bird's a better shot because half court, you know, uh, free throw line, etc., cetera, uh, are constraints that he worked within mm-hmm. and yeah, exactly good at working within. In the second piece too, yeah, you were talking about building things. The second thing that we help our clients build in our program is a funnel. So this is something that we, it's almost a done for you. There's still a little bit of work that the client has to do in terms of participating to build out their funnel. Yeah. But essentially the back end, we build we give them a funnel, like a fully functioning funnel, yeah. you know, website yeah. that they would probably have to spend hours and hours and hours trying to build or spend thousands and thousands of dollars or, you know, hundreds of monthly subscriptions yeah. to get something workable that is systematized and easy to, to use. Um, and we, we, we do that for them. It's, wow. it's practically a, like a turnkey solution. Wow. Wow. That's pretty compelling. You're mm-hmm. going to be a busy guy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we're, we're starting to get busy. It's, yeah, it's good. yeah. Well, I mean, as we talked about the, you know, the explosion of the explosion of, um, you know, interest and engagement in, you know, in, in learning in new ways and learning new things. Um, you know, it's not not a, not about to die down. You've also got the big guys, the Amazon, Google, etc., realizing that they're going to have to help build their future workforce. Is it Amazon? I said they're going to train. I think they said they're going to train 40 million people or something like that in, yeah, in, in, in cloud computing. I, it was just a crazy wow. number. I, I think I'm right about that. 40, 40 million or 40,000. I think it's 40 million. Yeah. Hey. Um, you, do you ever, you ever, have you run across, across uh, Clayton Christensen in your reading? Uh, Innova- Innovator's about- Dilemma is the book that made him famous. It sounds familiar, and I've probably skimmed that book before. But yeah, no, that's what... de- def- definitely one. To, definitely one to that and the the, the follow-ons. He was uh, he's no longer no longer with us. He was a prof at Harvard Business School. As a matter yeah, of I remember yeah. him now. Yeah, I had a chance to meet him at a conference twenty cool. uh, something years ago. Yeah, what, like incredibly smart, just uh, and a complete gentleman. Um, but I had a, one of those brief hallway conference conversations with him. And I said, Dr. Christensen, here's the thing I'm curious about, education. Because we're this is this is 2099, it's a long time ago, right? Um, we were talking about disruption in other domains, and I said, what's gonna happen to higher ed? And he said, I'm honestly concerned. And he said, I think we'll see corporations starting to take that job over. And if you look hmm. at the landscape now, I think he was right. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, if, if your number is correct there with Amazon training 40 million people, I, I'm curious how that compares to how many graduates come out of Harvard, Yale, and Stanford. I don't, I doubt it's, you know, I bet it would be a fraction of that per year. Yeah, oh, a to- yeah, complete fraction of it. And, and you, you know, if, if you want to be, uh, if you want to be a cloud developer, um, speaking as one, you're not going to learn that. You're not going to learn that in a comp site university uh curriculum sorry they're just not there yet they're not keep there's mm-hmm. no way they could keep up because the stuff you really have to know now didn't exist two years ago mm-hmm. it's like you yeah. just can't institutionally adapt at at the pace required it's almost got to come from straight from the horse's mouth right straight from the from the companies who say you know oh, here's the you know here's the new machine that does x we need someone to help us run the machine we will train you on running the machine that we just invented um yesterday (laughs) yeah i've observed this too with um different courses if you're running a course for example if you're trying to teach a course on a new technology be that something like a tool like notion or on something 
in the crypto space, like minting a new NFT or getting into the crypto space or something like that. Mm -hmm. Courses, courses and topics where markets are booming is, is really a no brainer. If there's a type of technology out there, a platform that you, that you love, that you're super interested and curious about, and you have at least some experience and you've been able to cross at least a few milestones, right. To, to achieve some kind of level of expertise, Mm -hmm. man, you could create a course, you know, very quickly, very simply, um, and offer it up and people will buy it. Here's the, here's, seen, you know, here's the headline to validate what you just said. Amazon wants to train 29 million people to work in the cloud. Wall Street Journal a couple weeks ago. Wow. Big number, huh? That's a lot of people. That's yeah, so cloud, yeah, so cloud computing, um, there's, there's lots of opportunity there. So if anybody's listening, you're in cloud computing. <laughs> don't think that because... Amazon is teaching that you can't also teach. That you can't also teach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I suspect, I suspect someone with expertise in that domain who can, who can uh, debabelize it, right? Who can simp- not simplify for the, not simplify as in dumb down, but simplify as in make comprehensible. Um, there's a, there's a real market for that. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For that. Yeah, and it's not, it's not gonna. The, that the up curve and uptake of that's not going to die off anytime soon. I don't think mm-hmm. yeah. daunting to learn like daunting domain to keep up with really fricking hard because the pace of innovation right now is so white hot. There's, there's stuff that our company has in production that literally didn't exist a year ago that is now a vital part of the business. Mm-hmm. It's like, Oh crap. We got to learn that. Well, there's a big opportunity if we do. Okay, how's it work? How are we going to tie it into the other stuff? Uh, you know, learn, figure mm-hmm. it out. And as you're saying, then then maybe pass that knowledge along. Mm-hmm. Wow. Cool. Well, we should wrap up since I tied up a whole hour. Where does where do we send someone who says, "Well, that was a great conversation. I want to learn more because I've got a you know I've got a course in me, and I'd love to have a cohort." Where do we send them? So you can head over to nerddigital.com forward slash future of email. And what you'll be able to do is grab a calculator to give you at least a ballpark estimation of what you can earn with your course today. So there's a, a quick story to go with this. When Ted Seides from Capital Allocators called us, he was kind of sitting on an idea for a course. Mm-hmm. He had it kind of sketched on a piece of paper and He's like, you know, I, I went to this other course and I think we can do something similar. We have some ideas. I've written a book. What do you think we can do? And three to four months later, we broke six figures for his first. Kind of put those two stories together to say, you could be sitting on six figures and not know it, right? And so you can download this calculator, go to nerddigital.com, N-E-R-D-D-I-G-I-T-A-L.com forward slash future of email. And you'll be able to download the calculator plug in a few numbers and mm-hmm. what it'll do is it'll spit out an estimation of what you can expect in terms of, of revenue for your course. Nice. Nice. Well, Marcia Santos, it has been a fascinating and wide ranging conversation. A real pleasure. I thank you for making the time. Oh, I thank you, Matthew. Really appreciate it. And I hope we can connect again. Soon.